Okay, backup power. How many people are interested in anything in generators? Okay. Um, here's with generators, I'll just talk real quick then. Small generator is real critical. A big generator, not so critical. If you're trying to supply a whole house generator, like 15 kilowatts, and it's running in gasoline, you're going to need like a gasoline truck to keep that thing going. And you're going to go through about 100 bucks a day in gas. So I don't know many of us that can afford that. Now some people can, but most of us can't. But a small generator, like a little Honda 2000 or Honeywell 2000, that's a two, that's a two kilowatt generator. That will, or it, it can run for like all day long on a couple bucks, on like five bucks of gas. So you know, so think about with your generator. It's nice to have a big size generator to run something that in your house requires it, and they have a small generator to keep your basic circuits going. Now, if you want to hook your generator in your home, you either can run a snake of power ports and power strips throughout your home, and just run your critical items, like keep your refrigerator going, uh, you know, keep your radio going, some basic thing. Or you can plug into your grid, you can plug it into your house. Now, the way that I can't recommend that you do is the way that will kill a little kid. And that's, you can take a, a mail to mail, you can make your own extension cord and plug mail to mail and just plug your generator into the wall. But if somebody pulls that out of the wall and touches their hands across it, you've got live plugs and they might electrocute themselves. So the neighborhood kid or your son or your grandson or whatever might kill himself. So this is a safe way to do it. You can either run extension cords, totally safe, but then you're limited, like, you know, how many cords you got to go to how many places in your house. Or you can get what's called a transfer switch. And the one here on this side, this is a six circuit switch. Anybody with a little bit of know-how can go and wire this into your box in the back or you get an electrician to do it. And that dedicates, like, you can get them four, six, eight, but a typical one at Home Depot is like six circuits. So basically you decide which six circuits are critical in your house to supply. And your generator plugs in with a big 30 amp cord right here in the transfer switch. And when you switch this on, it automatically switches off from the house. Yes? Kilowatts. What, what are you running on? Two on two kilowatts, you're running your refrigerator, your computer. You're running a few lights. Um, you know, you're, you're running some basic stuff. You cannot run a hot water heater. Yeah. Hot, hot water heater, stove, electric stove. Those are like 50, those are 30 amp and 50 amp circuits. Right. So figure it for every amp in the circuit, and, and if it's 110, that's a kilowatt. I mean, for for every 10 amp, every 10 amps is a kilowatt. If you've got a 220 circuit, then it's only 5 amps per kilowatt. It's like double. So, so you figure any big item that takes a lot of electricity, like an electric heater or something, not a good idea to run off of electricity. Okay. You're, in a survival, you, you're in a situation, you want to burn something. If you want to generate heat, you want to burn a liquid. You want to burn wood. You want to burn kerosene. You want to burn propane. You don't want to burn electricity to make heat, because that's a lot of watts to make heat. Okay. Um, Let's see. This is a, a rather expensive, but it, you know, and there's other alternatives. This is just one of, one of them. There's a guy out here with one. And you have a little solar power and an inverter and a battery pack. This is all built into one little compact thing you can roll around. And when the gas is gone and everything's gone, this is still running. I've got like a nice solar panel on my trailer and a little inverter. And so it's not a lot of power, but it's something. It's enough to run my computers, cell phones, you know, some lights, some radios, things like that. Are they very fragile? Or no? no, they're not very fragile. I mean, solar panels, yeah, you drop it on the ground, you like, shatter it, and it's over. Yeah. But it's not like, I mean, it's on my trailer top, and I go through ice storms, it gets packed. I live in Truckee. We have 60 feet of snow this winter, you know. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, 10 miles from my house. We only had 30 feet of my house. So, you know. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it survives through all of that, you know, and it's not covered or anything. Uh, communications. I think I. I think I better just go through this real fast, as, and then we'll have a, answer a couple more questions, and you can ask me anything you want afterwards. This is a really good thing to have. It's a hand crank. It's a multi-powered unit. You can get them in any of the survival stores. It has a shortwave band as well as AM and FM, and 
when things have really fallen down, you'll often find that the shortwave guys are the ones you'll find your information from. And because the other people don't have a clue, and the shortwave guys know. This is a really much better shortwave receiver, but you need a power source for it, battery support. And this is a scanner. So if you live like in Tornado Alley, you should definitely have a weather radio and a scanner. Something with a, so you can turn the switch on or off for the alarm. It has so Noah on it, right? Yeah, it has Noah on it right here. I think all of these have Noah on it. And so uh, when you know that there's a real risk of a hurricane or something or a tornado, you turn the alarm on so you can hear the alerts. So the alert might come on and say, you know, there's one that touched down down the street from whatever. Okay. Uh, gas rationing is coming. Peak oil is real, no matter what you may think about it. Uh, there's only a limited amount of stuff. Even if there's adiabatic oil generating in the world, it's generating at a, at a rate so much slower than we're using oil. Most of the giant fields in the world are in serious decline right now. Mexico is going to be an oil importer in three years. They're, they're, you think Mexico's got problems now, three years from now, when the government loses their major source of income from selling us their oil from the Cantrell oil field? All hell is going to really break loose in that country without that source of income. And, uh, and their Saudi Arabia's past their peak. Um, <coughs> most of the major oil producers in the world have passed their peak now. And there is the U.S. government military released a report this spring, followed by the U.K. and the German military. It's basically saying by 2012 we're going to see some serious problems, potentially crisis problems by 2015. I think probably, almost certainly, crisis problems by 2015. Basically, there's still a lot of oil in the world, but they're not able to produce it at the rates they were, and it's harder and harder to get to. It wouldn't be drilling five miles underneath the Gulf to get oil if there was easier oil to get and cheaper oil to get somewhere else. They're spending all that money because for a reason, and that's because that's where the oil still is that they didn't already get. Now, EMP, okay. This is, I know, a subject everyone wants to know about. So I may spend the rest of my time on this one. And whatever. Yes? Is there anybody who has a Faraday box out there? Or if every metal box is a Faraday box. Okay. Any metal boxes. You can make a simple Faraday cage by, um, let me just turn this off. It's in the way. Okay. A simple Faraday cage. So. Quickly, an EMP, electromagnetic pulse or solar storm, induces these giant magnetic electromagnetic fields in the planet. And when they hit wires, they induce currents in the wires and fries microelectronics, particularly microelectronics. Now, an EMP, you can protect electronic devices in a fully enclosed metal box because the it'll it'll hit the box and sort of induce currents around the box that will protect what's inside. You can make a simple box by aluminum foil. So if you don't have a metal, say you have something big you want to protect electronics. If you've got a metal box, put it in a metal box. But if you want to be really sure, you'd use a double, double protection. And so if you don't have a box, that double protection means you cover it entirely with foil. Right. Or screen will work. It doesn't have to be perfect. Every little hole doesn't have to be covered. Mm -hmm. So like aluminum screens will work. And as well as the aluminum foil. And then you put a garbage bag around it, and then you put a second layer. So that's that's quite effective. There is a, uh, in the new book, talks a lot about EMP. I don't in the old book. And there is a site that you can download on the internet from the US military thing on how to ground and protect uh, equipment from EMP. But it's quite involved. And when they, when they did some, an EMP test with a nuke, air burst nuke over the Soviet Union, they had much worse effects than they predicted. This is like in 1962, before the test ban treaty went into place. And they found that they induced ground currents in buried cables that fried like major power transformers and knocked out you know, all the power in a very large area. They, they were quite blown away. They didn't expect to have such devastating effects from their airburst. And so just grounding things or being in the ground doesn't necessarily protect things. But the Faraday cages do a good job of protecting them. Do you run a ground up the ferry or no? No. That's what I'm saying is unless you know what you're doing, don't bother trying to ground the ferry to Cape or dig up the military. You can download it free on the internet. Yes. I read on um, Mr. Rawls' website that you could use the galvanized metal cans. You can use what? The galvanized metal trash cans with a type 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. Galvanized metal trash can. That's perfect. Yes. So if I buy one of these metal barns here on TV and put my car in there, it's my car safe. Your car, the thing about cars is that cars are actually quite resistant to EMP. <laughs> because cars are, they have sparks going off all the time. So they have EMP-like things happening in cars all the time. So in simulated EMP tests, only about 15% of the cars driving at the time were disabled. And most of your time, your cars will actually, if they're not driving and not operating at the time, they'll have electronic glitches in them, like the radios may be all screwed up and stuff, but the cars will actually be okay. But, but yes, a metal building like that is probably good, except I'm not sure because you're not going all the way around. And I'm not a physicist, even though I got an MIT degree, I'm, electronics, electrical stuff is not my scary, I'm decent at it, but it's not, I'm not a real expert at it. So I think that the Faraday cage to be fully work, that if you're inducing a field around it and it's got to surround 100% and then it kind of opposes itself, so like it's totally balanced. So if you have a shelter that's just a, an electronic box but not the bottom, you'll have an imbalance. You won't have the same balance going around the bottom. So I don't think it will work.